You're about to hear a rebroadcast of Where We Live. It originally aired September 5th, 2019, here on Connecticut Public Radio. This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Connecticut has some of the most expensive private higher ed institutions in the country, Western University and Trinity College among them, each costing more than $57,000 a year in tuition, room and board, and other fees. And while that bill is way above average compared to public four-year colleges, no one can argue the cost of a college degree in America keeps getting more expensive. Coming up, student loans are a necessity for many Americans who pursue higher education. But what are the wider ramifications of long-term debt? How is your family paying for college? You can join us. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. I want to welcome back to the show Magdalena Jandra, who's a financial advisor and partner with Jandra Wealth Management, LLC. Uh, Maggie, welcome back. Nice to see you again. So um, when we think about the cost of earning a college degree, we hear that it keeps getting high. So tell us more about like why are we seeing uh, the cost of tuition arising so much? Yeah, so um, colleges are looking to attract uh, more students, and that means spending, right? Spending on professors, spending on uh, gyms, on sports uh, institutions, right? Um, there are thousands of colleges here in the United States, and so to attract uh, uh, the right person, often you need the newest facilities. When we think about how colleges and universities are attracting uh students, uh, not everyone uh, can afford to pay the bill uh, just outright. And so I'm wondering, um, are we seeing uh, more colleges and universities looking uh, to students internationally who may be able to foot the full bill versus American students who have to figure out a way uh, in different ways of, of, filling, of paying the, the bill? Yeah, so many schools do look at that. They do look internationally. Often those students are full pay. Um, there are some exceptions. Uh, for instance, uh, Yale University here in Connecticut, they actually are one of five schools that are not only need blind when applying, meaning they don't look whether you can pay or not, but also they offer to meet um, whatever your need is. And that's both for domestic and international. But otherwise, most schools don't provide uh, that sort of grant or scholarship money internationally. Mm-hmm. Uh, when we were looking uh, at uh, putting this show together, there's uh, obviously this is in the news a lot, but there's actually uh, something that was happening in the state of Illinois. Um, some families were coming up with a, a workaround, so to speak, so that their child uh, would be able to access student aid. Can you tell us more about that? Yes. Yeah, so this was not illegal. This was a loophole in the financial aid process. Uh, whether it's ethical, we could talk about that at other time. But essentially what was happening was Uh, parents in Illinois were giving up guardianship of their high school students in order for them to receive more financial aid when they apply. As Again, this was a loophole, um, and so it did work for some parents. Um, And of course, the legislators there and regulators are looking to close that loophole now. That's really interesting that some families thought of that uh, possibility. But guardianship, that's really serious. That's when someone doesn't have a parent or parent uh, that can really take care of them. And they come up with a a way, a legal way uh, to be able to, you know, make do. And so the idea that families are exploiting that is troublesome. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, I know later on the show, we're going to be talking about the mental uh, health piece about mm-hmm. this. You know, think about the effect of of, of a, a, you know, your, your son or daughter, you've given up guardianship of them simply for you to be able to afford college. I mean, it's definitely something stressful. And I think what was interesting here Unlike the other high-profile case, which involved celebrities and and the educational consultant, uh, William Singer, in this case, it was a lot of middle-class to upper-middle-class families, which maybe traditionally could have afforded college in the past, but given uh, exponential increases in tuition, they're now looking to also find creative ways to fund school. Uh, Maggie Jondro is in studio with me. She's a financial advisor and partner with Jondro Wealth Management as we look at the cost of higher education in the United States. Uh, we want to hear from you, how you're footing the bill for your child or children to attend college. Maybe uh, you're doing it on your own. You're a student and you've come up with ways to figure out how to pay for that bill. Uh, maybe a mix of savings and student loans. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. And we mentioned, you know, why uh, colleges are becoming more and more expensive. But when you look at the last three decades, what's been happening in terms of wage growth and inflation that makes this such a a problem today? 
Yeah, so inflation, of course, is the rising costs of goods and services, right? And if, when we look at college, that is a service. Um, so inflation over the last 17 years has averaged about 3.7%. Tuition growth over the last 17 years has averaged 7.4%. That is almost double. Mm-hmm. So when you think about the cost of other goods and services, they're not rising as quickly as tuition is. And then wages, of course, what we earn, how do we pay for these goods and services? Um, The short of it is it just hasn't kept up with inflation and especially not with college tuition. So um, looking at the years 1989 to 2016, the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis found that wage growth was 0.3%. So when we're comparing that to tuition growth of 7.4%, it's almost eight times faster growth of tuition. That's significant. And so you do then wonder, how are we meant to pay for college moving forward if tuition continues to grow at that rate? Uh, Student loan debt in this country, 44 million borrowers who collectively owe one and a half trillion dollars in debt, uh, student loan debt, uh, second to uh, mortgage debt. Uh, when we think about how colleges and universities are marketing themselves, uh, there's the one side, you know, trying to get your child or children into a certain college, but also how the different universities and colleges are competing against each other to get these students because they want someone or, or families that can pay these bills. That's right. Um, so there have been a lot of different rankings out there about the best college Uh, for your value, right? So maybe on paper, the college is $50,000 tuition, but some colleges do give more or traditionally more aid. Um, I think the top of that list last year was MIT. I know Yale here in Connecticut made the top five of that list. Um, So again, you have to look at what is the net tuition, the average net tuition that people are paying because they've gotten enough aid and grants and scholarship. Also, we have to look at what is the average amount that a student is making coming out of that school, right? If the average amount is a lot higher coming out of one institution than the next, maybe that is a consideration of whether you should attend or not. You can join our conversation. Find us on Facebook and Twitter uh, at Where We Live. Uh, before we take some calls, let's talk about some of the vehicles, so to speak, uh, plans that families uh, can think about in terms of trying to afford a college education. So first, when should some parents uh, be thinking about saving up for college? And then maybe walk us through some of the different options out there, Maggie. If you can, I say start right when your child's born, um, you know, even if it's just a little bit. Um, and, and one of the most popular vehicles is the 529 College Savings Plan. So here in Connecticut, we have the CHET plan, the Connecticut Higher Education Trust plan. Um, it, it's ad- really advantageous for a few reasons. There's a, it's tax-free investing, meaning that the money you put in grows tax-free, and so long as you're using it for a qualified education uh, reason, you don't pay tax on it. Also here in Connecticut, um, you do get a state tax deduction, $5,000 for if you're filing single and up to 10000 if you're filing joint. So if you're still itemizing your deductions, that's great. Um, but beyond that is you as a parent, if you open this up for your child, you retain control of the account. I always get the question, well, what if they decide not to go to college or what if they get a scholarship? Well, you actually retain control so you can give that account to another child or another family member. You could even use it on yourself. And I think what's most important is it has the least effect on financial aid in comparison to another type of account, such as a UTMA or an UTMA account. That's interesting because, you know, there's the argument uh, lots of middle class families will say if I, you know, I'm putting uh, aside money, uh, who knows what the sticker price will be uh, another uh, 15, 18 years from now. And if I've got this pot of money, that'll work against me. and I still won't be able to pay my son or daughter's uh, college bill. Sure. Um, if you are uh, lucky enough to be able to save any money, right, um, you're either going to put it into a savings account or you're going to put it into this 529 plan. Um, and I can tell you that what, what happens is there's an expected family contribution or an EFC calculation that is used to determine how much financial aid you are eligible for. And parental assets and parental income have the lowest effect on the EFC. Mm-hmm student income or student assets have a greater effect uh, without you know getting too deep into the numbers if you have a 529 plan the maximum kind of reduction you can get in in benefits because of that amount is 5.64% on the contrary if you just gave the money to your child that reduction is 20% 
So you can see how that's the most minimum effect. I mean, if you have the ability to save, that money's going to be there somewhere anyway. So you might as well put it towards something that you want to pay for in the end. So 529s, so that's the, the most common, but there's other options, other savings accounts, uh, Coverdell, and then also the acronym UTMA. Tell us about this. Sure. So a Coverdell um, has has become a little less popular than the 529 plan. It has the same kind of tax provisions that I mentioned already. However, um, there's limits. So there's a uh, income limit. So if you're making somewhere between 95000 and 220000 depending on how you file taxes, you're already going to be in that phase-out period. Um, you also can only be adding uh, money until the beneficiary or your child is 18 years old, and that money has to be used by the time they're 30. And there's a $2,000 a year limit per beneficiary. So it has a lot of the same benefits as a 529 plan, but a lot more limitations. And for that reason, only about 5% of Americans have a Coverdell in comparison to 42% of Americans have a 529 plan. Um, the UTMA, or the UTMA, which you mentioned, that stands for the Uniform Transfer to Minors Act. And it's essentially a savings account that uh, you can invest assets in um, that you set up on behalf of your child. The money must be used for your child in the end. But the, the interesting point here is it doesn't have to be used for college. However, when the child reaches the age of majority, which here in Connecticut is 21, the child is able to use that money for whatever they choose. So maybe it's something responsible like college or a down payment on a house, but it could be something that they just really want, like a fancy red sports car. So um, that's one of the problems there. Uh, the tax treatment isn't as favorable as the 529 plans. And as I mentioned, it's considered student assets. So it's going to be a greater reduction on financial aid than the 529 plan. Mag Magdalena Jondro here with me on Where We Live, a financial advisor. As we talk about uh, the high cost of higher education, we want to hear um, how you're pulling it off, how you're paying the bill or thinking about ways of uh, supporting your child or children. Regina from West Hartford. Regina, go ahead. Hi, I'm the mother of triplets who are in their junior year of high school and another one is a freshman. So, of course, the idea of sending them all to school is a little daunting. Um, I heard from friends of mine that uh, live in Maine that there is a state portal that they could go to and that list all of the scholarships available for the state of Maine in one spot. And you just basically put in your information and that tells you what you're eligible for. Is there anything like that in the state of Connecticut? That's a great question. Thank you. Um, so actually, if you go to fastweb.com, um, that does provide you a whole list of scholarships that you can search for, not only in Connecticut, but uh, nationally. Um, and the Sally May website also uh, provides that as well. Um, so I, I do know that those are available not only for Connecticut scholarship, but, but, but nationally. Uh, Carolyn's calling from Hartford. Carolyn, go, off. go ahead with your, with your uh, comment. Hi. Um, well, my comment is that I have uh, three daughters that were within four years of each other. And um, I got, to, you know, a seven sisters education and they went to a good high school and had good grades. But when looking at trying to send them to college, it just looked impossible. So my two older daughters who wanted to go into writing and theater ended up going to City University of New York schools just because they're so much less expensive. But on the other hand, you know, they really didn't get the same opportunity, the same attention um, that I was able to get, uh, even though you know, I earned a good living and they went to good high schools and got good grades. Uh, but the cost was just too daunting to pay, you know, $240,000 for a writing degree or a theater arts degree. So that go, daughter go. is, uh, go ahead. Oh, Carolyn, your, your phone was breaking up, but um, I'm just curious, uh, but are you, are you happy that they don't have, they're not saddled with the student loan debt that some other students um, may have because they're maybe going to that uh, college where it's $240,000 at, at the end when they get their degree? Exactly. I mean, that was one of the uh, things that we looked at was, you know, if you want to go into the arts, it doesn't make sense to be saddled with that amount of debt. And while maybe you don't have as prestigious a degree, um, you're going to just have to focus on, you know, doing what you can do uh, to make it in the field that you've chosen. 
uh, and not be saddled with that debt. Mm -hmm. And so that was a choice that we made, but it was still a tough choice for me. You know, I got to go to Vassar College and, you know, my daughters who were as smart and as studious and, you know, uh, got as good grades as me did not get that same Mm -hmm. opportunity because of the exponential rise Mm -hmm. in college costs. Well, thank you, Carolyn, for your call. Uh, Maggie, you're a financial advisor. I mean, what kind of conversations do you have with your clients? Because, you know, there is this idea of, you know, you want your child uh, maybe to go to the dream school, right? But at the same time, there's lots of uh, institutions that aren't as expensive that will also give him or her a great education. And so realistically, you know, how should parents be thinking about this moving forward? Because they're the ones thinking about how they're going to figure out their savings over the next two two decades. Yeah, I have to um, really commend Carolyn and her daughters. Um, that was sounds like a very responsible choice that they made. Um, so, so you know, those are the kind of conversations I'm having all the time. Um, I love to use this tool when I do seminars um, on this topic called a Nitro Score. So, if you go to score.nitrocollege.com, that's N-I-T-R-O. It really does this math that Carolyn was talking about. It says. This is the school I want to go into. This is the major I want to go into. And this is how much I'm going to get in scholarships, grants, um, and parental contribution. And then it assumes the rest is in loans. And then it shows you the average um, income that that major from that school earns your first first year, second, third year out of school. And you can even put in where you want to live. So a lot of students say, I want to go live in a big city. And you know, when you are saddled with debt and maybe making only $30,000 a year, you might not be able to live in that big city. Um, and so when students make uh, use this, it's a really easy tool. It gives you kind of a, a score with a red, yellow, and green saying, you should go to the school and take out these loans, or you should think twice. I think that really helps people make those decisions because the numbers simply don't lie, right? You have to think about what kind of life do you want over the next four years, but also what kind of life do you want thereafter? This is a very small piece of your entire life. And, you know, when I talk to education consultants, they also say going to the best school doesn't mean necessarily better resources. Overall, the statistics show it really just depends on what you do while you're there, the connections you choose to make, the internships you decide to take on, whether the school is more prestigious or less. Uh, Bob's calling from Berlin. Bob, go ahead. Yeah, well, you know, I, I do agree with what the uh, what she is saying. Uh, when, when we were making a decision for my daughter to go to nursing school here in Connecticut, Quinnipiac was actually offering probably one of the best nursing programs around. Unfortunately, four years later, she's about $115,000 in debt right now, and we've taken on some of that debt. Uh, and since graduation, she's been working steadily, uh, but it's just a mountain of debt, and it's almost uh, $1,200 a month. Uh, we, have not, uh, we haven't tried to combine our loan yet. Uh, through a SOFI or, or, or another agency. But it is just, it, it, it really is quite daunting, not only on her, but on us as well as we're trying to help her out as much as we can. And Bob, your daughter, uh, now that she's graduated, she has the, the good paying job. She is a nurse? She, she does. Uh, she's been at Hartford Hospital now for almost five years, uh, and she's making good money, uh, but just, just trying to pay off, and she lives on her own now, but just trying to pay off her rent, and that $110,000 is just like an anchor weighing over her right now. Mm. Well, thank you, Bob, uh, for your call. I mean, what's, I mean, we've done shows before, Maggie, uh, John Dro, and people will call and say, you know, I've got $200,000 in student loan debt. What is the strategy to pay that off? To me, that's another mortgage. Absolutely. Uh, thanks for your call, Bob. Actually, that brings up a really good uh, point. There are loan forgiveness programs for people in different professions. And the medical professions actually have quite a few loan forgiveness programs available. There's one called the Nurse Corps, since you said uh, your daughter is a nurse. And if you work in a high need area for two years, they will forgive um, some parts of your loan. Um, And so that's something to consider. Uh, If you go to the uh, National Institute of Health, the NIH's website, they have a whole list for doctors, dentists, nurses. So that's something to think about. Um, There's loan forgiveness for teachers. So again, teachers that are working in um, high need, low income areas. Um, and they're teaching math, science, or special education, there is a loan forgiveness program for them if they work five consecutive years and make income-based repayments up to $17,500. 
Um, there's a public student loan forgiveness. So if you um, work in the public sector for roughly 10 years, you have to make 120 um, income-based repayment uh, payments on time. You know, there's a whole strategy be- mm-hmm. beyond that uh, that we can talk about. But if you do that and you work in the public sector, your loan also can be forgiven. So there's some forgiveness programs out there. But for those of us in the private sector, you really have to be strategic about how you're paying off the loan. Uh, Bob mentioned uh, refinancing or consolidation. You know, that's that's a thought. The snowball method, the avalanche method, lots of different strategies out there. I, I know NPR just reported there have been issues with thousands of borrowers who were uh, doing public service jobs like teachers, like nurses, um, that have not been able uh, to get uh, that loan forgiveness. And so there was an expansion by Congress. Uh, and those lo- those borrowers are applying and they're still getting uh, denied. So we'll have to check in more about that program. But I want to take uh, one more call before we head to break. Uh, Kevin's calling from Babylon, New York. Kevin, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Um, So we have one child. He's a senior in high school right now. And um, we plan to uh, pay for his college uh, from the day he was born. We started a 529 plan. And uh, about 15 years ago, we um, refinanced the house and started paying uh, more principal off on the the mortgage so that uh, this year when he becomes a senior, the mortgage is paid off. So that, you know, the idea is that it's going to free up more money while he's actually in school to pay for it. And the hope is that, um, you know, between those two, we'll have enough, depending on what school he goes to. Um, one of the things that I find that's interesting as we get into this process more now that he's a senior is um, what does a school actually cost? Uh, it, there seems to be quite a, a difference between, say, the retail price of a tuition versus what uh, an individual will pay based on what you put into FAFSA and all that kind of stuff. So um, it, it should be interesting to see. I still don't know if we have enough money to pay for whatever school he decides to go to. Well, thank you, Kevin, for your call. Maggie, do you want to respond uh, to Kevin's approach? Sure, Kevin. Um, that's, you know, fantastic that you've been planning since um, since your son was born. Uh, the one thing to note uh, when applying for FAFSA, um, what is excluded from that expected family contribution formula I mentioned, um, it is your primary residence. So that is excluded. So you might want to think about um, you know how you approach that. Um, and also any retirement accounts are excluded from that, that calculation. So I always say retirement is wonderful to save for, right? We cannot borrow for retirement like we can for college. But here's an added incentive to kind of put more money into that because it won't be calculated towards what you're expected to pay. Um, so that, that, that is something to think about. But in terms of, of uh, putting into the, the formula and, and what schools actually cost, there are added, added costs. It's not just tuition. It's room and board. It's electronics. Um, thankfully, the 529 plans do cover a significant amount of uh, items beyond just tuition. This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathancho. We're talking about the cost of higher education in America with my guest, uh, Magdalena Jondro, financial advisor and partner with Jondro Wealth Management. And after the break, we're going to continue our conversation. Also find out how are all those free college programs doing in other states? And how are you paying for college, whether for yourself or for your child? Join the conversation. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. You're listening to a rebroadcast of Where We Live. It originally aired September 5th, 2019, here on Connecticut Public Radio. This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. We're talking about how Americans pay for a college degree as costs at private and public colleges and universities continue to grow. How are you paying for your child or children to attend college? Is it a mix of savings, student loans? You can join us. Find us on Facebook and Twitter uh, at Where We Live. Uh, Nick's calling from Avon. Nick, go ahead. I just like to talk a little bit about the GI Bill because I did four years in the Coast Guard after high school. I wasn't quite ready to go to college. And the GI Bill, basically, I immediately became financially independent from my parents. Um, And then once I got out, I got four years of free in-state tuition to, you know, basically any college in the U.S., any in-state college in the U.S. And um, you also, on top of that, get a housing allowance per month. And so, like in the Avon area, 
um, that's like around seventeen or eighteen hundred dollars a month, and that's something that I've heard a lot of these shows about student loans, and um, nobody mentions guidance counter counselors don't mention the military is an option, but it's a great option, and um, there's a lot of different jobs you can do in the military too. Well, thank you, Nick, uh, for your call to remind us about the GI benefits. Uh, Karen's calling from Waterbury. Karen, go ahead. Yes. Hi. How are you? Good. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I've been a community college professor for over 30 years, and I think that families uh, who do not have the financial means to pay any tuition really need to have conversations with their children about their direction. You can attend a community college for about $4,500 a year, let the students prove themselves academically, let them grow up a little bit, mature, and find their direction, and then head off to a university for the last two years. Um, I've seen many students come back from university and go to the community colleges because they just weren't ready, they had no direction, and I just think that parents are foolish to allow an 18-year-old to bankrupt their finances or to put themselves into debt for the next 30 years. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you, Karen, for your call. Uh, is that how you uh, talk to your clients about, again, uh, Maggie, about the different options out there? I mean, everyone has a different plan, but, you know, Karen brings up a good point. We talked about that, that there's uh, more affordable options and not to go bankrupt. You don't want to live your retirement uh, working and working because you can't have to keep paying for your child to go to, to go to college. Right, and student loans are not dischargeable in bankruptcy, I should mention as well. So <laughs> you could go bankrupt and you'll still have student loans. I mean, she brings up a great point. Um, You know, I always say you can have anything you want. You might not just be able to have it all at the same time. So um, an example I always like to use is um, a student I knew got got into very prestigious schools, but also got a full ride at um, University of Connecticut. And um, she chose University of Connecticut over, you know, an Ivy League school um, because she knew she intended to go to law school. And her parents had the means to pay for the Ivy League school. But um, so, in, in fact, they were a little alarmed. Wait, why aren't you going to this, you know, dream school, so to speak? And she was uh, mature enough to make that decision to say, well, I'd rather these funds be used for law school so that I could be debt free and really pursue what my passion is, right? Because sometimes our passions don't pay us necessarily what what we need to live on, especially if we have debt. So those are really important conversations to have, to think about alternatives. Um, In fact, just this weekend, I was speaking to somebody and he's enrolled in a coding boot camp. It's eight weeks long. And um, they said that once he graduates, he is expected to have a good, solid paying job in coding. So there's a lot of those out there now too, those programs which um, aren't necessarily college, but they do get you a a well-paying job afterwards. Uh, Maggie Jondro is a financial advisor here with us on Where We Live as we talk about uh, affording higher education. Uh, Joining us now in studio is Danielle Douglas-Gabriel, who covers the economics of higher education for The Washington Post. Danielle, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. We just heard from a community college professor here in Connecticut, and it's something that in Connecticut, there's talk about offering free college uh, by 2020. And now, of course, legislators are trying to figure out, well, how are we going to pay for that? Uh, There's 19 other states that have some type of free college program. Can you run down for us uh, how they're making it work? What states actually have a a really good model out there? So you're right. It's been a really cool organic grassroots movement on the state level. Um, I I think some of the best programs we've seen are coming out of state Tennessee. That's one of the older programs. And what's good about that program is that it recognizes that the traditional college student is no longer what we think of about 40% of college students are actually over 24. There are a lot of adult learners. And so Tennessee expanded their program to not only include recent high school graduates, but also adult learners who never completed a degree. And that's had a huge adoption rate since they decided to do so. Other, Other states, I think, are waiting to see what the uptake is before deciding whether to expand. There have been a lot of new uh, entrants into the into this movement, including Maryland, New York, 
Uh, Rhode Island recently passed a legislation as well. And I think they're trying to get a sense of what is the data showing us? Who's really going after these sorts of programs? How can we make sure that the students who are the neediest are the ones who are getting this help? A, a lot of the hiccups and I think growing pains of these programs is trying to figure out how to roll them out in a successful way with deadlines, mm-hmm. timelines, understanding when people apply for college, when they apply for the FAFSA, and trying to make sure all those things are kind of coordinated so that folks who really need this don't get miss out. And some states uh, have what they do, first dollar versus last dollar. So last dollar being they take uh, financial aid and, and different uh, other avenues before the state puts in the rest to pay for a student's education? Yes. Yeah, so most of these states are using the last dollar model. And it's really, it's politically tenable. And it's also economically tenable. It, it means that the state wouldn't have to cover as much tuition as if they offered a first do- dollar model. Unfortunately, what that means is a lot of low-income students who are um, eligible for maximum amount of Pell, federal Pell grants aren't getting a lot of that money because once they max out on, on Pell on tuition, then there's few, if any, dollars left over that the state would come in for. So that's kind of a problem. There are some states that are considering expanding for not just tuition, but also books and transportation, which are also costs that have to factor in, even if you're living at home. So they're they're trying to figure out if that is going to be a fiscally sound model that they can replicate. Mm. Uh, Danielle, we referenced the 44 million uh, borrowers in this country who are saddled with one and a half trillion dollars in debt. So demographically, who are we talking about? Who's most impacted by student loan debt these days? Right now, I mean, percentage wise, the largest population is under 30, right? But that doesn't mean that there aren't a lot of people in their 40s and even in their 60s who are still struggling with debt, oftentimes debt that they took on for their own education. A lot of folks went back into uh, higher education during the recession and are still dealing with the, the costs of that. And then sometimes parents and grandparents who took on debt for their children or grandchildren. Uh, eth- I guess racial-wise, uh, African Americans tend to struggle with uh, student loans at a larger rate than others, in part because of delinquencies, uh, also non un- being unable to complete, uh, dropping out, and so you're not getting that degree that would help you get a better job to make it easier for you to pay it off. So we're seeing a high level of default rates. And then even college graduates who are African American still sometimes struggle with those payments in part because not having the family resources, racial wealth disparities make them more likely to have to borrow in larger amounts. And so being able to pay that off becomes a little bit more challenging than it might be for other groups who can potentially rely on their parents to help them out if things get rough. Uh, and who actually deserves a free education has come up in the presidential debates with Democratic candidates. Uh, they've got different plans out there of who they think should uh, afford, be able to get free college. And can you walk us through what some of the, the big questions are in terms of, of who can Uh, be eligible for this type of program? So income has become a big issue, right? So you have uh, candidates like uh, Pete Buttigieg saying that he doesn't think it's right that the average uh, taxpayer should have to foot the bill for a student whose family could afford to otherwise pay for college. And so he wants to assist uh, students in their uh, collegiate pursuits, but only if they're low income. Mm -hmm. You have Amy Klobuchar saying two years of community college is sufficient to help students, right? Biden hasn't quite come out right in the past. He's been supportive of two years of community college. Other candidates like Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders said, no, uh, four years should be completely covered for at public universities. Let's be honest, even middle class families still struggle with the cost of college. So if we're going to offer this benefit, we might want to make it as universal as possible to help as many people. And I think there's also kind of an ideological component to it. So we used to think of higher education as a public good, a better educated citizen, uh, Mm -hmm. uh, more educated citizens means more political participation. It means also economic benefit to the country. As that started to change in the 80s and it became more of an individual good or thought of as an individual good, then people didn't necessarily think that the public should have to kick in any kind of resources for that. And you started to see in a lot of states, well, when budgets got tight, they started to cut back. And higher education is an easy one to cut back because if you reduce state appropriations, you increase tuition. Mm-hmm. So there's always some kind of mechanism to, to offset that loss. And so I, I feel like some of the 
that ideology is reflected in how the candidates are viewing college. They all think, see it as an important good, but if we're going to have, if we're going to help people and if we have limited resources, where we direct that money for some makes more sense for low-income students, whereas others say this will be politically um, tenable if we help as many people as possible. So, Danielle Douglas-Gabriel covers economics of higher education for The Washington Post. Also with me, financial advisor Magdalena Jondro. Uh, Maggie, I'm wondering with the, the debate about free college, uh, does that uh, muddy up the water where people are thinking, well, you know, by the time my kid is uh, ready for school, maybe uh, Connecticut will have free college and I'm not going to have to worry about saving. I actually think it's the opposite, um, unfortunately, or fortunately, however you look at it. I think people are un- are skeptical. You know, unfortunately, Connecticut has its own budget deficit problem. And so finding the cost is, is, is the big question mark here, right? So I think people are actually planning the opposite, that college tuition is going to be expensive, and they actually are saving more rather than less. Uh, Kate's calling from West Hartford. Kate, go, go ahead. You're on where we live. Hi, thank you. I'm calling because I have four young children, um, elementary school aged and younger, and I find it very confusing to figure out how to responsibly save for the four of them when, you know, there's such a disparate amount that college could cost depending on whether, you know, they go to a, a state school or a private university. And I'm wondering, you know, how do you live? Do you suggest that people save a certain percentage of their income? Is it a set amount every month? Do you forego any sort of discretionary spending um, to save as much as you can? Um, I find it confusing, especially with four children. Mm, That's a great question, Kate. Yeah, so Kate, I I definitely recommend reaching out to a professional only because I think everyone's situation is very unique. We have to talk about your goals. Is your goal to fund 100% of the tuition? Well, then, yes, you'll probably have to give up um, um, some discretionary spending. Is your goal to only uh, do 50% of an in-state tuition and have uh, the rest be taken out in student loans? And, you know, student loans have a bad rep, but there is an element of having skin in the game, so to speak, right? Um, One story, uh, you know, anecdotal story I know of is somebody uh, told their their son that they had to take out full loans for college. So that son was very strategic in what he majored in, majored in, in the internships he took on. And then he had a job right out of school at a big four accounting firm, which you know traditionally does pay well. Um, and upon graduation, they told him, you know, we're actually going to help you with these student loans. We're going to pay them off. But because he had skin in the game, they felt he was more responsible about his choices within college and didn't go and, you know, traditionally party or, or whatever, you know, some of the cliches are. So I think it's important to think about what is your goal, how much do you want to fund it, and then also thinking about how are we saving? Are we saving in a vehicle that's growing? You know, it's an investment, or are you just saving in a in a plain savings account? Well, those are going to have really different outcomes. So, um, you know, unfortunately, I think everyone needs to go and revisit this with a professional themselves for their particular household. Mm. Uh, Danielle, you know, all of us know uh, someone who may have be saddled with a lot of debt. Uh, and uh, earlier, Maggie said that, you know, some of us want to pursue our passions, but sometimes that doesn't uh, pay the bills. And if you've got all of this debt, you can be really saddled uh, for decades. And and so when we think about uh, post-secondary education, you know, is it is it worth it for some listeners to pursue um, maybe Maybe they don't want to be saddled with this, this kind of debt uh, because just because you go to a four-year college doesn't mean you get that dream job with a good salary. You just have to be strategic, honestly. Uh, if you are going into a liberal arts field, for instance, that you know doesn't pay more than, say, $40,000 your first year or maybe first five years out of school, perhaps keep your borrowing under that amount. I've heard lots of consultants tell me that that a good rule of thumb is don't borrow any more than you would make in your first uh, job out of school. And oftentimes that is easier to pay off within 10 years than if you borrow more than that amount. Um, I think also there are Gosh, over 6,000 schools in this country. There is so much, uh, so many options for higher education, nonprofit privates, there are for profits, there's public universities. And while everyone thinks of public universities as just the flagships, there's been a lot of great data uh, coming out about regional publics and how successful they are at helping lift people into the middle class. And I think people need to pay more attention to what are the options that are available for your children before making a decision that 
the most prestigious and elite is the only path towards success and, and upward mobility. There are lots of options out there. So you can follow your passion. You just have to be strategic about how to do it. And here in Connecticut, we hear from the manufacturing uh, industry, uh, apprenticeship programs uh, where uh, they may not be going to the four-year uh, college, but they're able to get the right training to find that that good paying job. Certainly. And what's, what's really interesting is that there are still a lot of companies right now that they will hire you on and can help you uh, foot the bill for continuing education in a lot of those sorts of trade jobs. So even if you don't start off with a four-year degree, you know, my dad, honestly, when he was in his 60s, his jo- job decided that they wanted their workforce to have a little bit more training. So they paid for them to take some advanced courses at a local community college. And it was very helpful. And you still have companies that see the value in doing that and pursue those sorts of uh, pathways. Uh, we heard from a listener, uh, Kathy, who said she did AmeriCorps for two years, which helped pay off student loans. And she got $10,000 a year towards paying off the loan. So there's another uh, option uh, for people looking uh, to not be saddled with high debt. I want to thank uh, Danielle Douglas, Gabriel, for coming on the show today, who covers the uh, economics of higher education for The Washington Post. Danielle, thank you for coming in. Thanks for having me. This is Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. You know, after the break, we're going to talk more about, you know, what, it's one thing to figure out how to pay for college, but it also takes a physical and emotional toll on students and families. So we'll talk more about that. You can join us too. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. You're listening to a rebroadcast of Where We Live. It originally aired September 5th, 2019 here on Connecticut Public Radio. This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Student loans are a necessity for many Americans who pursue higher education, but what are the wider ramifications of long-term debt? Uh, joining our conversation now by phone is Ariel Pastic, who is a pediatric nurse practitioner at Connecticut Pediatrics at Community Health Center. Uh, Ariel, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. So I'm, I'm curious if you could talk about uh, with uh, college-bound adolescents, you know, when typically uh, are you seeing uh, teenagers uh, having stress and anxiety about uh, not only going to college, but how they're going to pay for it in their families? So I, I think uh, even before that, now we're starting to see anxiety start uh, in middle school, going into high school, trying to build those resumes up so that they can get into the colleges of their choices. So we're starting to see a lot of pressures put on them, not just family-wise, but you know through social media and the pressures of their peers of trying to make sure that they are involved in as many extracurriculars as possible. And then it, it continues to get larger and larger as the application process begins for college and then on top of that, the, the effect of the student loans and how they're going to pay for it in the future. So you're talking about uh, children that are in 6th, 7th, 8th grade having anxiety about, about college? I think it, it's more the performance of, of, you know, the future. You're looking not just this current year or where you're going, but are you doing enough stuff that it's going to look great on your resume and your application for college so that you can get into the best college of your choice? Uh, And nowadays, it's not just how great your grades are, but what else are you doing with your life outside? Are you volunteering? Are you playing sports? Are you doing other extracurricular activities? It puts a lot of pressure on a lot of kids nowadays, and we're seeing increased levels of anxiety. Uh, We know there's extreme wealth here in the state of Connecticut, but there's also income disparities. You know, how does this break down when we're talking to uh, lower income students when, you know, they also want to have a plan for the future, but they're not really quite sure uh, what they need to do and how their families are going to afford it? I I think a lot of that, I see a lot of that here at at the Community Health Center is we're, we're seeing a lot of children choosing not to go to college because they're working two jobs to help pay for the household expenses. And then in the process, if they do decide that they want that higher education, choosing the community college to start while they figure out where their their future is going to take them. Mm. Uh, When we were talking earlier with financial advisor uh, Maggie Jondro, uh, there is this real pressure uh, on uh, students to maybe get into uh, where uh, their parents uh, went to school or to go to the dream school. So how do you have the conversation with families about uh, maybe helping ease that anxiety and stress on their child? 
I think a lot of it is is trying to, you know, recognize that every kid is different and every family is different and trying to not put those extra pressures on your child is going to help them the best for their mental health in the future. So trying to say, do the best that you can do and get where you would like to go, but trying to relieve those pressures of, of making sure that they're getting to the highest level possible or going where everyone in the family has gone in the past. Mm. Uh, do you find that families are receptive to that advice from you uh, because you see the toll it's taking on their child? I do. I think, you know, in this, in a lot of a um, circumstances, you see a lot of families, you know, we're seeing a lot more that are choosing the trade options. Um, a lot of the trade schools here in the Hartford area, you know, going on from there, they don't have to do the college route. And so we're seeing a lot of the lesser pressures put on them um, versus, you know, making sure that you're getting to that highest potential in the future. Uh, Arielle, I mentioned you're a pediatric nurse practitioner, so that takes uh, uh, several years of schooling. How were you impacted, um, you know, with paying for your education? Uh, I have I have a whole bunch of student loan debt that I'm, I'm currently working off. Um, I think, you know, I would have benefited from having some financial education when I was in high school and, and knowing where my future was going to take me. I started as a pre-med Um, at a four-year liberal arts college and decided my senior year nursing was really where I was meant to be in life. Um, So I have a second bachelor's degree in pediatric or in nursing, and then I got my master's on top of that. So I have a whole bunch of student loan that I'm paying off. And I, I think, you know, looking back on it, I would have appreciated more of a financial education. I'm, I'm glad you bring up that point, Arielle. Uh, Maggie Jonder is still with me. Uh, Maggie, what needs to be done uh, to, I guess, uh, improve financial literacy, making sure that these uh, uh, conversations happen much earlier than when it's time to fill out the FAFSA? Yeah, so um, I'm, I already am seeing that across schools, people are bringing in financial consultants and trying to have that conversation at the high school level, thankfully. Um, I think, you know, the boomers went to college, maybe took out small loans, but it, it very often worked through college and were able to leave college virtually debt free because of the cost was just so much lower. I think it was the the millennials that really suffered the most because that's when you saw that exponential increase in tuition. Um, but people were just signing on the dotted line, not really knowing because you were told, go get that degree, you'll have a great paying job after. I'm really um, happy to see that there's a lot more education and a lot more conversations around should you be taking on debt? How much should you be taking on? And what does that mean for your future? Um, you know, I think Ariel brings up a good point. Let's talk to children about what they want to do going into school. And if they're not sure yet, it has become much more popular to start taking gap years. Maybe you'll work during that gap year and try to figure out what you want to do. And don't just blindly pay money into a degree you may not need. You mentioned that some schools are bringing in consultants to help uh, educate students about, you know, financial aid and, you know, what it takes to to pay down debt. But is that something we're seeing, you know, across the board here in Connecticut or just pockets of schools that have the resources or thinking about this? Yeah, I think, um, unfortunately, it's still probably the schools with more resources. But, um, for instance, I volunteer with the Connecticut Money School here, and I know that they do bring in experts to the lower income communities um, in and anyone can apply to the Connecticut Money School and, and bring in an expert. So um, check them out for sure. Um, and they can bring in someone to talk about the cost of college and budgeting and, and credit worthiness and things like that. Well, I want to thank Magdalena Jandro again for coming in uh, today here on Where We Live. It's always a popular topic, and we'll talk about it again, uh, how to pay for higher education. She's a financial advisor and partner with Jandro Wealth Management, LLC. Thanks for, thanks for coming on. Thank you very much. Also, Arielle Pastic, a pediatric nurse practitioner at Community Health Center. Uh, thank you so much, Arielle, for joining us on Where We Live. Thank you for having me. Uh, today's show produced by Lydia Brown. Uh, thanks to Carmen Baskoff on the phones. Our technical producer is Kion Wolf. You can learn more about the show. Just download our podcast on your favorite podcast app. I'm Lucy Nalbethanchel. Thanks for listening. <laughs>